So finally they start paying attention to me and they've got me on a gurney. Now the surgical intern comes like, oh, excuse me, Mr. Chin, oh, we need to see the wound, please. And so I move my hand away and blood goes across the room. And he goes, whoa. You do not want to hear your doctor go, whoa, when he's treating you. And his response is to take his finger and jam it into the wound as far as it'll go. And he goes, well, we got to stop the bleeding. Someone else, when one of the regulars suggested, you know, like, you must have really been getting Satan's attention to have him attack you like this. And I gave that some thought. You know, maybe you are called to do something pretty great here. Satan sees it even if you don't. My name's Barry. A lot of people who knew me 20 years ago probably wouldn't recognize me now. I used to be a really, really kind of uptight kind of person, and people kind of laugh when I say that now because they can't picture that at all. I have lived a life that's been characterized with a lot of self-sabotage. A lot of it was I was just kind of afraid of being successful, <laughs> and I was just kind of happy to get by to subsist when God has a lot more out there. There's the story that Jesus says, okay, if your child asks you for a fish, we give him a stone. In my life, the experience was it wasn't necessarily a stone, but like God would give me this tofu patty. It was nutritious, but it was totally unappealing, and I had to somehow be grateful for it, which kind of skewed my view of God. I think the simplest way of putting it is, your faith is going to be affected by your view of God, and the more misconceptions you have about God, the more your faith is gonna be flawed or skewed in some way. I go to a church in Eagle Rock, and a group of 20-somethings started feeding the homeless in Central Park here in Pasadena. And one of them, I know from choir, invited me to join them. And so I did. This would have been roughly, oh, 2010, 2011 or so. Part of the challenge also was, okay, I'm gonna budget myself 20 bucks. What can I do? What can I go get on sale? Kind of like if you're a restaurant person, the idea of staff meal, you just take whatever you've got that's left in the kitchen and you try and make something that's gonna be palatable. But it's not just about the food. I've heard of people that if the staff meal isn't good or if they don't feel like they're gaining what their nourishment, not just physically or uh, culinarily, if it doesn't really like, nourish them in a soul way, they'll move on to a different job. I've kind of evolved to try and creating that kind of atmosphere when we go to the park. As I've spent more time with some of the homeless and also having gone through some financial issues of my own, I've been able to experience more firsthand what it's like. Three years ago, I spent the better part of a year living in an RV that had no running water and had a extension cord running through a window through which I ran a microwave, a toaster oven, the rice cooker, and a couple of uh, slow cookers. And that's kind of where I got into cooking more using slow cookers and electric appliances that versus cooking on the stove. I guess at some level, I, I kind of hope that some people can see that and use that as inspiration, say, yeah, I mean, he's not just coming in from some high lofty spot. <laughs> he's lived on the street, he slept in his car, he's had to deal with this and that. He knows what it's like. I think C.S. Lewis put it, you know, you can get people to, to stray from the faith by using the word and, Christianity and. I took that to mean basically whenever you focus on a commonality that's other than Jesus and make that more important than your faith as to why you gather, it's gonna affect your faith and I don't think it does it in a good way. Because when you start to focus on that commonality, you also notice people that don't fit in and you tend to exclude them. I don't think Jesus did that kind of thing. The black beans, we started these this morning. They look like they're almost done. Simply flavored, cumin, garlic, jalapeno pepper, a little bit of chicken broth. One guy told me I make beans better than his grandmother. I'm not sure if that's true, but it was nice to hear. <laughs> yeah. This is actually a typical day. <laughs> this might make more sense. This way, if it spills, now it gets soaked up. If people don't come for the food, I'm not offended. <laughs> I would rather them come for the chance to come and feel part of the community, because I feel a lot of them, they're used to being invisible. I just want to make sure they don't feel that way when they come to dinner. 
uh, is back in March of 2013 when we just finished serving dinner. We'd started a devotional and we were studying, the, it was a passage about the depravity of man. And right after that, someone came up behind me with a box cutter and stabbed me in the neck. Severed the anterior branch of my carotid. So I did not have any idea that my lifeblood was leaking out of my neck. And I'm just like, ow, like who hit me? And the lady next to me said, Barry, you're bleeding here. Take this t-shirt and just hold it to your neck. And I'm like, oh, okay. I have no idea of how seriously I've been hurt. They took me to the hospital. And so we get there and uh, they have no idea we're coming because we're coming civilians in, a, in our own car. So I'm knocking on all the locked doors and finally an order lets me in and says, like, what do, you, what do you want? And the nurse sees me and goes like, how do you get in there? What you doing in here? And I'm like, well, I've been stabbed. I'm like, well, you need to go to the front desk and register. And I'm like, Okay, let's stay calm. And so I walk over to the front desk. Fortunately, I think it was like 12 minutes from stabbing. I was in a war and they were operating on me. Huntington has a policy where if you are the victim of an attack, they will assign an alias to you so that people, if they want to try and hurt you, they can't find you. So they named me Gustavo Perez. Yeah. You know, Gustavo Perez. I mean, that's as likely a name as you're going to find. Merce comes and says, um, there's someone named Michael here who claims to know you. And I'm like, okay, I've still got, I've just, I'm just still suffering from the chest. It's like, so does he have my cell phone charger? He goes, yes. I'm like, mm, mm, mm. and fortunately he had my cell phone charger. I had him go back at my laptop and I began, I got on Facebook, posted pictures of me in the hospital with the chest tube and all that stuff. And Gustavo Perez is alive and well and living. I suppose someone else, when they were almost killed, would have probably quit, but um, there were just a couple things. One was the response of one particular regular that when I came back, he appointed himself my bodyguard and he was never more than five feet from me the entire time I was at the park for the next five, four or five months. And even when he talked to me, he never looked at my face. He was always scanning the area behind me to make sure that no one was sneaking up on me. I have to admit I was touched by that kind of loyalty and I just felt like I couldn't, I just couldn't turn my back on that. As you start to care for people, you start to see them the way God sees them. There's a guy, he's about my age, he's only got one working arm and he uses that to control the joystick on his, on his electric wheelchair. And because of his palsy, he, his speech is very difficult to understand. He started coming to our church accepted Christ and he's been trying to get involved with our ministry that greets people. He just wants to be a greeter and to be treated like everyone else. When we're in heaven, he's going to be in the sky doing barrel rolls. You know, he's going to be free of the wheelchair. We're going to see him the way God's seen him all along. Experiences like that that make me want to keep doing it. So, well, right now it's during the quarantine and the homeless would normally have a place to go during the day at the library, but they can't. And you may not think about it too much, but they have no place to recharge their phones. They have no place to stay out the heat or to get warm out of the cold or to get their Wi-Fi. And that's a really, really difficult thing to try to deal with. I think it's more important to try and address the needs. What I'd really love to do is get these people washed up in clean clothes, and I'd love to start giving them some dance lessons. I love dance. Dance is one of the major constellations in my universe. I competed in ballroom for a while. I've danced on some TV shows like Gilmore Girls, Big Bang Theory, and there is just so much you can learn. There's just a great chance to give them some socialization skills. I've been feeding the homeless for almost 10 years now, I think, it is now that I can believe that God wants this ministry to flourish. It's what I want to keep doing until God calls me home.